you're tuning in to Geek Speak, a Geek Insider production. We're sitting with special guests in entertainment, news, and tech. So sit back and enjoy the show as we geek out together right now. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Meredith Lochran, and this is Geek Speak. I have a special guest with me today, Dimitri Logothetis, writer and director. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you're going to see that screenshot here. He is the uh, the director of Jiu-Jitsu, which stars Nicolas Cage. Let me drop this card here. Hi, Dimitri. How are you? Good, Meredith. How are you? I'm doing really well. And now I thought you were on the West Coast, but you are, in fact, across the pond. So it's kind of late for you right now. It is, but it's OK. I mean, I stay up pretty late anyway. I'm uh, I'm in the Mediterranean prepping a couple of uh, of new pictures. Oh, so the Mediterranean. How's the weather, though? I bet it's beautiful. It's just like it is in Los Angeles, actually. It's the same. It's kind of the same temperature. It's, it's a little uh, cold at night, but really warm in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to watch jujitsu, and I was uh, I was actually a little bit surprised that Nicolas Cage wasn't as like he wasn't in every scene. Uh, but um, what was it like working with him and? Um, and tell us a little bit about jujitsu because I believe this started in a comic book, didn't it? It did. Um, I relaunched the Kickboxer franchise, um, which was originally was Jean Claude Van Damme, <clears throat> and I did Kickboxer Vengeance, um, and I uh, starred a new uh, fellow by the name of uh, Elan Moussi, who was a French Canadian, um, and then I did Kickboxer Vengeance. I brought Jean-Claude Van Damme back to be the mentor teacher. And then I also did a sequel to that called Kickboxer Retaliation. And I had uh, both of them back. And then I, I always had uh, some major martial artists as well as some uh, uh, major world champions from uh, all over uh, the fight world, uh, primarily MMA. And then also I had Mike Tyson in the last one. So in any case, I was sitting there thinking to myself, how is it that I can ramp up um, this genre? And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could do science fiction martial arts? And so I sat down with my writing partner of 25 years, uh, Jim McGrath. And I said to Jim, I said, look, I said, why don't we write a comic book? And then he said, uh, have you lost your mind? And I said, perhaps I have, but why don't we write a comic book anyway? And I said, that way I can take a look and see what the picture is going to look like. And so we went ahead and we wrote a comic book uh, of the same name. And then I looked at the comic book and I thought, you know, I think this is going to make a pretty cool film. Um, and it was, you know, based on putting together this sort of crew uh, that goes up against this formidable uh, foe and uh, that, that can never be beaten and has never been beaten. Uh, you know, similar to the Expendables, Mission Impossible, that kind of stuff, except uh, set in the martial arts world. And uh, and that's really how the whole thing came about. Uh, and uh, I never in my wildest dreams expected uh, that it would be in the top five on Netflix in the U.S. And then it also ended up now it's right. Right. This minute, it's number one in Canada on Netflix. So. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, which means it's sort of crossed out of the martial arts genre and into the action genre and into, you know, you can't, you can't hit those numbers uh, on pure martial arts uh, audiences alone or science fiction audiences. So you really have to kind of go mainstream. And again, I, I'm grateful, uh, believe me, but I never for one second, I, I normally, my films always hit the top 40. Um, however, uh, Kickboxer Retaliation, Kickboxer Vengeance is in the top 15 uh, most watched films on Netflix right now. So they've been around for about five years. So uh, somehow or other, uh, the audience is finding the films and, you know, they're entertaining. They're a lot of fun. Uh, they're escape. Uh, a, a few of my friends have said that I like to make guilty pleasure films. <laughs> so if you if you like a little guilty pleasure, 
uh, watch jujitsu. Well, now I understand Jean Claude Van Damme, but Nicolas Cage, you don't really think of MMA fighting and things like that. What was what was the selection process like in in um, getting him for this film? Well, Nick is a wonderful action star. I mean, he starred in a number of action films and he always delivers uh, a, a pretty amazing character. Um, you know, we were originally talking about uh, Bruce Willis. And we were very close to making a deal with Bruce. Um, but I'm so happy that it was Nick because Nick uh, really brought so much to this character. Um, he, uh, he was on a 20 some odd hour flight because we shot the film in Cyprus. Um, and then he gets off the plane and he immediately meets with me and he says, Dimitri he said, what would you like me to do to help you tell this story? He said, you know, I've got a bunch of ideas, but I want to know you as a storyteller, what is it exactly that I can do? How can I help? I mean, he's just a terrific, uh, uh, marvelous actor to work with. You know, you don't win an Academy Award without giving a hundred percent. Um, and so he, he said to me, he said, you know, I was thinking, just because this character has sort of been trapped for six years uh, in this, in this, uh, in Burma, um, he said, you know, I think maybe I was going to channel, um, I was thinking about channeling uh, Dennis Hopper in Apocalypse Now. And I said, right on. And so that's what he did. And uh, he's really the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of the film because he, he lays out, the exposition, he lays out the story and uh, the background of the story. And I, I know he's not in the beginning of the film, but I must tell you, he's in about a third of the whole movie. So that's uh, that's quite a bit of uh, screen time besides the action sequences that he did. Now, um, there are a lot of faces that are recognizable now because of the films that they, uh, the, you know, whether it's big screen or little screen that they're in. Um, how were you able to get this cast together? Because I think perhaps when you were making this movie, they were maybe virtually unknown. Or did you have a connection with them from working in other things? Well, I mean, Tony Jaw is a marvelous uh, martial artist, and he's a really well-known martial artist. He was in Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. He started in a movie called Ong Bak, The Thai Warrior, which really gave him his break. I think that was discovered um, uh, and brought over, uh, from Thailand. And so he made sequels to that, but he's been around. I think he just did a, a movie with uh, Mila Jovovich, uh, monster hunter. So he's been around for quite a while and he's really a well-known martial artist. I mean, uh, let's see Juju Chan starting yeah. uh, tiger hidden dragon. She's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see Frank Grillo. You know, he's got his own television series and he starred in a number of, of pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the most recent is Boss Level with Mel Gibson. Um, let's see who else. Uh, Alain Moussi, you know, starred in the, in the first two kickboxers for me. Um, so, you know, there's a number of really well-known actors in, in, in the picture that have been in the action genre. So, and, and they've either starred in their own films or... or uh, or not. Um, but I was just fortunate enough to, to bring them all together because I really needed that kind of ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. Now, wasn't this a fairly small budget compared to some of the bigger Hollywood films? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm an independent. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, even when I make a picture, um, you know, anywhere between, you know, uh, anywhere below 20, uh, 25, 28 million. Um, if, if, uh, you know, the, it, it, there's always the cash and there's always the deferments and all kinds of stuff. So you hear all kinds of numbers that are printed and everybody always tells me, you know, well, I read on Google that the picture costs uh, 30 million and it's, it's really more about the amount of money you have to work with because money's time. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't have a hundred million or 150 million to make a picture. So my time is very valuable to me. And, uh, luckily I have uh, my my predominant cast is martial artists and uh, and they're able to do all of their own stunt work much better than any stuntman can do anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so consequently, I don't have to double people 
uh, which really, A, uh, the audience is love. And I don't really need to do the kind of things. Like, for instance, I can take anybody um, in a science fiction, uh, you know, a Marvel film and, and attach them to wires and fly them around. When you take a look at my guys, my guys are actually doing uh, uh, backflips, front flips, uh, standing aerials. Um, you know, Juju Chan, the kind of uh, stuff that she does is just phenomenal. Um, and so I think once the audiences watch this, they really respond to it because the athleticism that they bring as, as action stars to the screen is just really a marvel to watch, you know. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think it's a testament to you as a director also because you might be able to take a stunt person, you know, I mean, you take a stunt person and you, the, you, they get the action and stuff like that, but to put them in the camera and take direction and, and be the actor, like that, that's your face on there, it has to be two slightly different animals. Well, I appreciate that, Meredith. It's very nice of you to say. Um, it is. And, you know, there's, you're always juggling this, right? Because I don't think you can approach a martial arts film and a martial arts centric film without a true martial artist. I don't think that the audiences will accept it around the world. I mean, you know, you go all the way back to Bruce Lee, you know, you take a look at Jackie Chan, you take a look at Jet Li, you know, you see, um, you know, you really need a Jean-Claude Van Damme. You need people that, that uh, are true martial artists at heart. Um, and so you have to start there, okay? So now <clears throat> you have to get a performance out of them as well. And so I try to keep the performances within the range of what they can pull off. And then I bring in some wonderful supporting actors around them um, to really help tell the story. Um, and so I, I always try to play that balance. But again, I think that, you know, you have, you know, you have to have really uh, stellar martial artists in, uh, to, to, to get the audiences uh, to jump into the genre. And I want to kind of circle back to the comic book connection, because for me personally, I've, uh, I've been scripting out my own comic books. It is not easy. Okay. I am so glad that I'm doing this when I'm older. <laughs> what was that process like for you? <laughs> it's just, just like you. You know, the good news about a comic book is that you can do a lot of exposition. So you can, you, you know, you can say something like, well, um, you know, 2000 years ago, uh, the uh, planets collided. And after the collision, uh, they manufactured 15 other planets. And then you just go right to that. And so you, you can do things in three and four sentences that sort of wrap up, you know, something that in a movie you'd have to sit there and actually uh, shoot, you know, uh, or create. So that's the, that's the beauty of a, of a comic book because, you know, you're sort of forced to, to contain everything, right? What do, you, what do you normally write in a comic book? 15 pages, uh, 12 to 18 pages, something like that. So you're really forced to sort of condense down a story. Um, and then once you have that, for me, it helps you to get to uh, treatment and then ultimately to a script. So so uh, uh, we're writing a comic book right now for Jiu Jitsu 2, actually. So we'll have that done in about a week. And then we'll be going to print on that next month because that's going to be the uh, the backbone for the new Jiu Jitsu that, uh, that all of the... Uh, the fans and distributors around the world have asked me to start uh, putting together. Now with the, with the comic book, is that something that you're planning on uh, financing yourself and distributing? Uh, where can that be found, you know, book one and book two, or is it something that you plan on maybe going to Kickstarter or Indiegogo with for crowdfunding? You know, I financed the first one myself and uh, through my company. And then I, I did that specifically because I wanted to see it. And then we printed up, I don't remember how many we printed up, I think maybe about three or 4,000. And then we, we, uh, we published them through Amazon. And then I gave a bunch of, away to a bunch of comic book stores around the country. Uh, and it was really funny, you know, when you make a film, now all of a sudden we've got orders. <laughs> so they're like, can we get the comic book? Uh, how can we get the comic? Can you, you know, can you print some more up for us? So on this next round, I have a feeling that uh, I'll be able to just get it published. 
Um, not that I care. I mean, I really care about going to the film itself, but but I do spend an awful lot of time uh, making sure that it's that it's uh, that there's a really wonderful uh, uh, comic book illustrator that really starts to 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 spell out the characters and stuff. Yeah. So I, uh, being that this is Geek Insider, I love getting inside the geek uh, and asking your Genesis story. Was filmmaking your the the plan? Was it Plan no. B? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was it was never Plan B. It was never Plan A. It was just happened. I mean, I um, my, you know, my family always wanted me to be a business major, so I was. I went to junior college, and there was uh, I had to take either a speech class or a um, an acting class. So I took the acting class, and the gentleman that taught the acting class. Uh, and El Camino College was, was a wonderful acting coach by the name of Burnett Ferguson. And uh, he looked at me and he ran the whole department. He said to me, he said, you know something? He said, you're a really good actor. He said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to star you in a play. Um, and he said, I want, you, I want you to star in this play. And I said, I don't want to act in a play. <laughs> I said, I just want to finish this acting class and, you know, finish move on to, you know, to business school and, and move on to, you know, get out, get out of this two years and, and, and continue on. He said, no, no, no. He goes, really? He said, I'm telling you, you're going to have a really good time. And I want to star you in this play. And the, the play was Treasure Island. And he had me play a, a Captain Smollett, you know, the leader of the good guys. And so uh, from there, I got an agent. And then I immediately started booking a bunch of commercials. And then I did a bunch of films as an actor. I did, uh, the most significant one was, uh, I had a small part in a movie called New York, New York with Liza Minnelli and Robert De Niro that uh, Scorsese directed. And so he's the one <clears throat> that recommended that I go into film school because he saw something that I'd been writing on the set, which was for, for uh, an English class. I was writing a short story. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, you should go to film school. And I said to him, I said, what's film school? Because it was a new thing, you know, film school. And he said, oh, he goes, you, you know, you're going to learn to be a filmmaker. And I said, why would I do that? <laughs> so I was like, he said, I'm going to write you a letter. He goes, because you're a good storyteller. And he said, that's what you need to be. And so uh, he wrote me a letter um, and I submitted it to a bunch of different film schools and I got accepted in film school. So it just, you know, that's how it happened. Um, and I ended up being pretty good. Um, I ended up uh, getting a scholarship to Loyola and then I did a short film that won about 12 national and international film awards. And, uh, then I got a job, uh, working as a director in cable TV, which was also a brand new thing at the time. And that's how it all continued from there, you know? Well, I mean, it takes more than storytelling, the ability to storytell, because you have to have an eye for angles and things. And and being a director as well, uh, communicating with the stars and uh, and the other crew, because now you're dealing with all of these personalities. So there's a little, well, I was going to say, there's a lot of psychology that goes into that as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well... <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, uh, my father was really wonderful because I, I got into photography and so that's where my geekdom came from. And so when I was going to college, I just thought, you know, I better really learn photography and I better really learn lighting. And, uh, so I, I got, uh, I learned lighting really well and I learned my lenses. Um, and I had some wonderful, uh, professionals at Loyola, uh, Marymount and, uh, in the South Bay in Los Angeles. And uh, so that's really how I got into that side of it. And I really had a, a pretty good eye uh, for, for camera. Um, and so I, I uh, and, you know, we were shooting film back then. So film school was really film school, you know? Um, so I, I pretty much had to learn from scratch how to edit a film and how to make sound in a film and how to, how to take a script and a story and, and put it up on the screen, which is a completely different thing than writing a book or writing a short story. And so I really learned, you know, I, I remember one of, um, one of these excellent professors that I had there, 
he just said to me, he said, look, he said, you should be able to just turn the sound off in a movie and you should be able to watch the film um, and you should be able to know what's going on. He said, it's got nothing to do um, with any of the dialogue at all. And he said, if you're telling uh, the story um, or your actors are telling the story, he said, uh, you're not, you, you don't get it. <laughs> he said, you should be able to tell it with images. And so that was, that's always been my goal. And um, so to this day, I'm still working on trying to figure that out and, and, uh, and do the best I can with that, you know. Um, okay, so you mentioned film school, photography, business. Where does the martial arts come into play? Um, I, had, I have two black belts. I uh, okay. got a black belt in uh, Tang Sudo. Um, from a, a really wonderful world champion martial artist named Howard Jackson, who uh, um, was just a terrific martial artist when I was about 18, 19. And then I went on and I got a black belt in Kempo. Um, and so, um, which, which is a martial art that, uh, um, that Elvis Presley and uh, Bruce Lee and stuff uh, started. And I actually worked out with Elvis Presley uh, when I was very young in the dojo. I was I was used as his sparring partner, you know, by the uh, by my uh, my uh, sensei in the dojo. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So that's so, where the I mean, martial that, arts from. But that takes I mean that takes decades though. I mean it could because aren't there different levels of the the black belt too? Yeah, and I was young, so it, it, within the course of about ten years is when I got both both mm -hmm. belts, and uh, and then uh, Howard, uh, who who was my teacher, and and he was a fighter. He fought around the world, and he forced us to sort of spar uh, back in the day and and go to uh, competition and fight in in competition. You know, which I hated because I just I just said Howard, you know, I said I don't I don't really want to fight. Um, and he kept saying to me, he said, yeah, I'm going to get good at this unless you go out and you fight people you don't know. So he said, uh, I don't really care what you want to do. <laughs> so, so, um, and you know, the wonderful thing about martial arts is it teaches you discipline. Mm -hmm. It teaches you respect. And, uh, most of the, the, uh, fighters that I have uh, been blessed to work with a uh, world champions around the world, they are some of the humblest people you'll ever meet in your life. Um, they have a sweetness about them that, uh, that when they step out of the ring, they just happen to be really, uh, really, uh, humble and sweet and, and, uh, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, so, um, I think it's, it's kind of a wonderful thing and taught I, me a lot of discipline. I, I would, I would hope so because when really pushed, they, they could kill you, <laughs> you know? And I think with that kind of, uh, with that kind of power and strength, though, you know, you have to have some kind of, you know, way to to just say, no, it's OK. You do you <laughs> or I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, in the ring, uh, in the ring, it's a whole other thing in competition. But but we were always from from all the guys that I ever learned from, we were taught exact to do the exact opposite. If you were going to get into any kind of confrontation outside of the ring, your, your primary goal was to not, to get out of it, to say, you're sorry, I apologize. Even if you knew you could take them, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be the last thing you do. Um, and so um, it, it, that builds a lot of character, you know? So again, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to make a, a documentary early on in my career called Champions Forever with Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Larry Holmes, and Ken Norton. And it was the first documentary of its kind where all these boxers were, were put together and they were talking about themselves and what their, their fights were like and the competitions that they had. And uh, one of my favorite uh, times was spending the time that I did with Muhammad Ali because he was just a really incredible human being. You know, he was one of the, the kindest uh, bravest human beings that I'd ever met. So again, I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet some pretty great people. Um, and, uh, that, that's where the martial arts comes from. Well, I'd like to pivot into that if you don't mind. Uh, 
as a young filmmaker, how in the world did you get names like that into the same room and say yes to a film? Um, well, it's primarily, you know, not thinking that you can't do it. So I thought, There's God, you know, nobody uh, has ever gotten these guys together. Everybody's always talking about them. You know, I grew up with Wide World of Sports. And so you always had this commentator talking about what these guys were thinking and what they're thinking when they're getting into the ring and their background. And I thought, you know, why don't we hear it directly from them? Why don't we put them all together? And then I reached out to a, a few buddies of mine and, and I said, you know, is there any way that anybody knows Muhammad Ali? And I found a fellow that did. And so he went out and talked to Ali. And then Ali said that he was into it. And then I, I just started to put money together. Uh, as an independent to do a documentary. And documentaries were not a big deal at the time. Like, you know, everybody thought, why would you want to do this? And But I found a few people that thought it would be a good idea. And that documentary ended up being um, one of the highest selling documentaries of all time back for about 10 years. You know, we broke a bunch of records when they were selling videotapes. Um, but that's really how it started. I guess, you know, I was just uh, uh, too dumb to know that you can't do it. So I just said, well, what the heck? I said, you know, why don't we just go ahead and try to do it? And and I ended up putting it together. Everybody I would call, all the distributors, they told me I'd never be, I'd never pull it off. So I, I remember talking to one distributor who we ended up making a deal with. His name was Jim Jamiro, and he had a company called J2, okay? And they were selling videotape. I think he used to sell stuff for Disney or something. And so I called him on the phone, and he laughed at me. And he said, oh, you'll never get all these guys together in one room. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm supposed to put them all together in Vegas, and they're being hosted at the Sands Hotel um, uh, by the Sands uh, managers and stuff like that. And I said, so why don't you fly out? And I said, if I get them together, I said, you have to bring me a cashier's check for $250,000 is the down payment against the contract because you're going to distribute it in America. And uh, he said, deal. So he was a, he was a, he was a, he's short, you know, he was about five, two, something like that. And so I remember him flying out and I, and I had all the boxers, all five of these boxers in, in Texas. Okay. So I shoved him right in the center of the, of the, of the boxers. And there he was looking around and I said, Jim, I said, where's the check? <laughs> so he pulls this check out and he hands it, you know, we're independents. I mean, and uh, he just he just looked around. He looked at these giant men around him, you know, and he just handed the check and said, you got a deal. And it ended up being a very successful. Uh, it ended up being a very, very successful project. And, and one of my favorite projects, by the way. Champions That's amazing. Road. That is amazing. Uh, <laughs> now, so, so how how did the 18 year old Dimitri doing martial arts and things like that eventually merge into making martial art films <laughs> I have no idea. I, I mean, was it just what was it like uh hey i've got this idea and just kind of scribbling notes and things or no what was, uh -uh. What was that like i was directing i i started working at a cable television company it was the biggest cable company in, in los angeles and i was directing uh, television shows uh talk shows game shows and then i put a small company together uh um, and start, and I wanted to make independent features and, and I made a couple of, of goofy, small, independent features, a little horror film and, and a couple of sexy comedies that were very popular at the time. And then many years, you know, I started directing TV and I got into action television. I directed, uh, a considerable amount of action television. And then I ended up becoming a showrunner and act actually executive produced a couple of TV shows for Warner brothers. And I remember having a, um, it was springtime and I, and, and during spring break, I would take my son down to Encinitas and I'd book a house down there and we'd hang out in Encinitas and, and he was down there with his buddy and I'm watching them on, on their little laptop and they're watching this, this movie called Ong Bok, the Thai warrior starring Tony John, you know, and they're, they must've watched it in that week 10 times. And I said, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, and they said, you know, he's dad, dad, you got to see this. He said, this is a, this guy's really cool. Look at the stuff this guy does. And I said, oh, wow. I said, he's, he's amazing. I said, so 
I said, all right. I said, I'm going to put together a martial arts film. And he said, you put together? I said, yeah. I said, I said, let me see if I can get out and get this guy. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. I ended up uh, years later uh, purchasing a, a, a company called King's Road with some partners. And then King's Road happened to have the Kickboxer franchise in it. And that's how I relaunched the Kickboxer franchise. I tried to get Tony Jaw for Kickboxer. He wasn't available because he was, he was he just kicked off a huge career. And then I finally landed him for jujitsu. So, so that's how it all happened. I mean, I was just watching my son. And, you know, my son and his, and his friend were geeks. They just were kids who just were into computers and, and they were, uh, they were just into all of this wild stuff and they were watching and, and really, you know, very, very smart kids. Um, and they were just fascinated by martial arts. And I thought, you guys, you know, really like this stuff. And, uh, they said, oh yeah, it's amazing. And I said, all right. And, you know, my son said to me, he said, Daddy, he goes, you used to do martial arts. I said, yeah. He goes, you were pretty good, right? And I said, yeah, I was pretty good. And he said, well, you know, you're really going to do a martial arts film? I said, sure. Yeah, why not? And that's basically how it happens. That's usually how everything happens. You know, I just kind of think about it. And then uh, it just crosses my path. And then I decided to jump on it and just get it done. Now, I've kind of crawled through your IMDb a little bit. So you've got some horror in there. You've got action and and obviously with the martial arts. Is there a particular genre that you enjoy more than others? I think I enjoy action. Mm -hmm. I think that you'll see that the primarily it's action. And, uh, you know, it's always about no matter what, it's always about that. Um, the care, the leading character for me is always about that little boy and little girl, and all of us that's been bullied and uh, been pushed around. And hopefully a lot of the people, both men and women that watch my films will say, man, I'm really going to start working out now. I'm really, I mean, that was really cool. I mean, it's going to get me back into the gym. It's going to get me back into this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I try to instill in the characters uh, a kind of a code and uh, the fact that they're, they're willing to lay their life on the line for the greater good and for their family and their friends and um, and so that's probably the thing that drives me the most is, is, is the, the, is the fact that this character is willing to sacrifice for the greater good. So. And, and it seems like jujitsu kind of marries them a little bit there because I mean, you kind of get that, uh, obviously with the martial arts, but you got a little bit of predator in there, some alien action going on. Yeah. You know, everybody, everybody sees that. And, but before Predator, I'll tell you, you know, one of my favorite films growing up was The Day the Earth Stood Still. Oh, uh, yes. Very good film. And the, the original Day the Earth Stood Still with Howard, the, who, which Howard Hawks directed. Um, and that was before my time, but nevertheless, I saw it in film school and I just found it to be really fascinating, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something else that I really loved a lot was The Thing, which was, uh, which took place up in the North Pole. And the remake with John Carpenter, I always found to be really cool too. So I, uh, for me, uh, that's really where that, that Genesis comes from, you know, uh, and of course everybody knows predator cause it's the most recent, uh, film like that. But, but that's really, uh, you know, if you look at my, um, Brax character, um, and, uh, he was designed after alien. If you look at the Alien 2 and 3 movies and you take a look at Brax's suit, you'll see that there's an awful lot of Geiger, you know, who's a wonderful designer who designed that whole that whole movie and the look of the movie. So those are some of my inspirations for that. And I think uh, I think we pulled it off. Now, um, with jujitsu, th there's um, I, I guess you're doing a bit of a franchise with it. Because, you know, with the with the genesis of the comic book going into the film and things and now possibly going into the well, I mean, you already said you're making the second comic book and another film. How far do you think that this story arc is going to be live streaming? There's a dog. Well, I mean, Kickboxer, before I got involved in the company, they made seven. 
and we made two. They want me to make a third one. So as long as the audiences uh, like it and are into it and we can come up with new ideas, I mean, you're right. There is a franchise there, and, um, and I never knew there would be, but uh, I hoped there would be. But I certainly didn't think that it would take off as quickly as it did. You know, the original Kickboxer with Jean-Claude Van Damme was panned uh, by the critics. You know, critics never really like martial arts films. Um, they sort of, it's certainly Western critics, um, uh, they, they just think they're goofy. Um, but on the, in the East, you know, they think they're the best movies you can make. They're, they're, they're the Western of the East, you know. Um, and uh, however, you know, interestingly enough, my Kickboxer Retaliation got 92% uh, critics on Rotten Tomatoes, and I think our, our audience is up around 80. I know that our audience on this one on Rotten Tomatoes is around 70%. So evidently the audience is far surpassing um, the critics. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my a lot of my friends keep saying that we've sort of hit a little pop culture here. So <laughs> hopefully they'll be around for quite a while, you know. Well, it just seems like, um, you know, it's kind of cyclical in a way. And it seems like you're kind of getting right back into it where people are receptive to it again. And, uh, and I think quite honestly, just my opinion that because we were shut down last year, you know, and people have gotten their COVID bodies, you know, kind of growing into their chairs and stuff like that. They're, they're looking at these action films and being motivated to move and uh, get back into shape and things like that. And you, and we see those things and I think it's a good influence. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, I make escape and I give you the ability to live through characters and escape a little bit and forget what's going on around you. And I think, you know, right now, I think we're all in desperate need of some escape and we're also in desperate need of some real heroes, you know, um, the one thing that I try to do is I try to inject as much authentic authenticism um, in the action and in my uh, uh, martial artists. And they, that's what they bring to the screen. Because, again, I said I can't compete with the, with the huge budgets. But my, my guys and gals do everything that you see. And it's some of the most amazing, amazing athleticism that you'll ever see from, uh, from martial artists. And uh, I appreciate that because nothing like movies to, to escape for a short period of time. Um, what, because I, as if you weren't busy enough with the comic book in another film, what else do you have in the pipeline? Um, I'm working on a movie called The uh, Man of War, which was written by Gary Scott Thompson, who wrote the Fast and Furious film franchise. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got a couple of films that I'm working on with another partner of mine, um, which is All of Me, a remake of All of Me, which is a comedy that uh, um, I'm going to be producing. Um, well, that's a big switch for you. Kind yeah. Of. Well, but I mean, I, you know, I like all films. Um, and I, but, but as a filmmaker, I know what I can do really well. And uh, I'm, I'm not a comedy director. And so that's something that, that we've got to, really put in the hands of a wonderful, you know, a comedic director. And so I've got that. I've got uh, uh, another picture. Uh, I've been looking to do something else with Nick Cage. And so we're going back and forth and, and we may have found something. But I can't make that announcement for a while. So um, I've got a number of things that, that I'm constantly working on. They want me to make another kickboxer, the, the uh, last of this round, so to speak, a kickboxer three called Kickboxer Armageddon. So, um, and then I'm going to put together some, again, some really wonderful, um, martial artists in that. So, you know, jujitsu too. So there's, there's a lot to, to put together. <laughs> How do you keep it all straight? <laughs> One day at a time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just focus, focus on whatever it is I'm doing, you know, today and, and, uh, keep it all moving forward and, and see, uh, what gets really exciting. And what I want to dedicate my life to for the next year and a half, you know? Yeah. No, and speaking of dedicating your life to a certain project, how long does it normally take from, I guess, concept to release uh, on any particular project? 
Well, with major studios, it can take years and years and years. You just don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got major projects that major stars are putting together all the time. And unless they feel that the timing is right or the script is right or the rewrite is right, um, it can take years. It can take many, many years. Um, with independence, we can't afford to, uh, you know, all of me is going to be a major studio. Um, but the independent pictures that I do, I can't afford to put time into something that I don't make. Um, and so I try to get everything done within about a year and a half. So once I focus on one particular project, I try to get it, uh, written, shot and done and out within about a year and a half. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, um, see, uh, I'm kind of rubbing elbows with a lot of people who are in the comic book industry, right? And so the like the brass ring is DC, it's Marvel. Um, but you have a lot of people who are independent. They're like, no, I'm good. You know, it's like, sure, I would love to get credits in that. Is that kind of similar in in movies where, you know, you kind of look at the big studios and you're like, that's the brass ring. I know I made it when I go there. Or the the that independent spirit is like, Hey, I'm, I am uh, in charge of my own destiny in a way. Well, I think barring it's streaming. The money, the money. <laughs> well, I think streaming has completely uh, changed all that. And I think COVID has, has added to that because there are no theaters. Um, theaters are just coming back. Um, and however, you know, we uh, in jujitsu rose to the very top of Netflix and we beat out some huge motion pictures, which again, I'm very grateful for and wasn't expecting. So clearly if you make entertainment, you'll be found. And the audiences, you know, you, you know, it's 200, what is it? 200 million subscribers, I think, on Netflix in the US and another, you know, 20 million in Canada. So you can't hit, you know, number one or the top five unless you've got all of them watching, you know, and, uh, or the majority of them watching, let's put it that way. So I think that streaming has completely leveled the playing field and anybody who makes a good picture, which is the way it should be anyway, um, is able to just uh, is just able to rise to the top and grab an audience. And again, I think that, you know, the audiences today, they're pretty specific about what they want. They really know what they want. And uh, and they're all looking for something new. And they're all looking for something, you know, I, I'm for one, I was, I was trapped for months indoors. I think I watched all my favorite TV shows over and over and over again, just because I wanted to see those again. Um, you know, going all the way back to, uh, the Sopranos. So I just kept watching all these shows and the Vikings now, and you know, um, the new Star Trek movies and, and suddenly you ran out of pictures to watch. So anytime a new movie came out, you know, or, uh, the tiger King came on. <laughs> I'm like, Oh great. Let's watch that. Cause I mean, I just want to see how, how can I kill another three or four hours today before, you know, I, I go out to, to try to see if I can buy a, a soda. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, that, that really enabled us to sort of focus on what we like and, uh, and to, and I think the audiences around the world have done just that. Well, we have blasted past the half hour mark, and I do appreciate your time. I know it's getting late over in Cyprus, so we're going to let you go. But for Geek Insider, we normally have one final question that we ask all our guests. And that is, if you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice. Dimitri, what would that be? Um, Don't worry about all that stuff you're worried about. Um, and don't try to sit there and, uh, predict and, and plan your life because, uh, it's just going to evolve in a good way and just keep putting one foot in front of the other and everything's going to be just fine. So relax. That's what I would say. That is good advice for anybody. And if you guys are tuning in, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or listening in on the podcast, make sure that you head over to DimitriSite.com to get in touch. Also follow Jiu-Jitsu on Instagram. Jiu-Jitsu is on Netflix right now. Make sure that you head over there and give it a review. Those are helpful too. Uh, Dimitri, is there anything else that we can add uh, anywhere else that people can follow you? 
No, I think those are those are terrific places. Uh, Dimitri's site is also on Instagram. So um, I appreciate the time that you gave me, Meredith. And uh, uh, everybody stay safe and uh, and have fun. We appreciate you looking forward to more movies and whatever else is uh, to come. Hope that we can stay in touch. And, and I hope you come back when you have other things that you're releasing. I will. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, everybody. This is Dimitri Lobothetis with Geek Speak. Thank you for tuning in. We're out of here. Geek out. At Geek Insider, we foster relationships with those in the geek sphere so we can give our audience the insider view of entertainment, tech, and more. 